Welcome to the Conduit Deeper podcast, a podcast that takes a deep dive into the details that surround our current sermon series, from current events to fascinating finds, to conversations that take us deeper into the Word. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to our Deeper Podcast. My name is Mo, Executive Pastor at Conduit Church, joined with our lead pastor, Darren Tyler, where we're on a journey through Genesis. Um, The series is called The Gospel According to God, and I'm wondering how long we're going to take to get through 11 chapters. We had a goal of maybe getting through 11 chapters in 11 weeks. That goal has derailed uh, as we're in week three of the first chapter. Um, but don't you think we can kind of start cruising from here? No. <laughs> no, I don't either. I mean, I think it's really good intentions. I think it's possible. Yeah. I don't think it's probable. It's like um, incongruent goals, meaning that you don't want people to get bored because we're like we're in the same book for like five years or whatever. And on the other hand, there's a lot in there. So a, yeah, it's juicy. Yeah. It's juicy. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot happening in it's Genesis. Like the carnivore diet, man, where there's no carbs at all. This no. is just straight prime rib in New York strip. Meat sweats. Yeah. Yeah, I had a little bit of that on Sunday, honestly. Yeah, there's 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 just so much happening in here. Um as we're going through the book of Genesis, we wrapped up the end of chapter one where it talks about um having dominion over the animals, creating in receiving, and we'll get into all that here in a second, but you had mentioned, you know, kind of having dominion over or creating an environment for life. Um, you mentioned that in one service that we got a new puppy. The, yeah. By we, meaning you. By me, meaning my wife. Yeah, meaning <laughs> meaning you. Because you're the one going home for lunch, you know, taking it out to potty. You're it's the a tag one. Team like, so effort. Is it? It's a tag team effort. It's a, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm torn, bittersweet. You know, Jennifer's really wanted a, a puppy for her birthday, which was yesterday, by the way. Happy birthday to my wife. And so, you know, like a good husband, I said, okay, yeah, babe, we can have a puppy. What has happened since pulling the trigger is I've watched all of the benefits of this season of empty nesting. Mm completely fly out the window. Yeah, because it's no longer the kids knocking on the door at happy hour. Like <laughs> it's puppy. <the> puppy. <laughs> Scratching at the door. <laughs> it's it's changed our lives. You know, I, of course. I mean it's a puppy. And he's like the cutest thing you've ever seen. Right. He's a golden, golden doodle. I mean he's just he looks like a stuffed animal. He's amazing. And also uh annoys the stink out of me half the time. Is there a as a young man, a puppy is a chick magnet. Like a, a, that, a, a missed business opportunity is renting puppies for young single guys at the park to pick up <laughs> like girls. Uber puppy or something. Yeah, yeah. But but the question is, is you know, you're not uh, you're not old by any means, but you've hit the forty year. You know, turned over on the odometer there. Does the puppy still have the same effect on a female? I as think it so. would at 19? I think so. Yeah. So this could work out very well for you. For, it's, for, it is for sure working for out well for. For for some of us, uh, <laughs> I'm just I'm just missing my freedoms in my sleep because it's a puppy. But you know we've we've created this environment, you yep. know, for him to yeah. The point, right? Yeah. The, the point of this is like it's it's an, it's analogous. Uh, we've created this environment for him to have sustainable life and growth. And quite frankly, after four weeks of having a puppy, he has doubled in size. Remember those little like little sponge things you'd put in the water and they just, yeah. you know, get, you know, 10, 10 X size of when you put it in the water. That's what's happening with his puppy right now in real time. Like, I don't know how it's possible for him to grow bones this quickly. Right, you think he'd have like he need some Advil, <laughs> right. you know, <laughs> like growing pains for dogs. It's unbelievable. Huh. But again, to the point. I mean, this is similar, not unsimilar, not dissimilar to what the Lord has done for us in creating <laughs> us in an environment to sustain life. Now, be honest with me. Was this a stretch for an analogy? I mean, I felt like it. It made so much sense, but as I was speaking it, I'm like, "This a this might be a reach." <laughs> no, it makes but, sense. It's it's the creator like, in the in creating and those within the the realm of creation. Uh, this is this is my new life right now, but it is it, it all ties together. 
Yeah, in fact, including the part about uh, the new creation destroying your good creation. <laughs> right. Like, puppies just chew creation. You need you to follow these rules. Like, why can't you just lay in your bed and right. be happy with chewing on the chew toy I bought You've you? Got why this, does it need to be my right? shoe? You have this entire acre of land yeah. to defecate anywhere you choose. Why would you choose the, the bonus room? The bonus room, yeah. Of the, <laughs> it's like, come on. The bonus room of knowledge of good and evil. Like, why are you defecating here? Yeah, and so this is where we find ourselves in, in Genesis. You showed a video as well uh, called The Fine-Tuning of the Universe. Really eye-opening. I think, I think I was aware of some of these things, but maybe not all of them. But it was a, a video compilation of all of the, the mathematical impossibilities that it takes, essentially, right. for life to sustain, to be sustainable on Earth. To, to like, the, the most far reaches of the universe behind the decimal point, like 10, 20 places behind the decimal point. Bizarre, accuracy. like bizarrely. Even Christopher Hitchens and Dawkins, like, you know, they say they well, we have our arguments against it, but they would admit that th that's a pretty compelling idea. That the, not only was a universe created, but it was so perfectly created that if anything from the strong force weak force if any of that was tweaked at all that it would it wouldn't have happened and i first i, I was thinking about this because i was just pulled it up the first time i encountered this was in the what is in a weird place um there's one of my favorite authors is a guy named bill bryson uh, his most famous book is A Walk in the Woods. I think it was like Oprah's book club, like circa 2001, before everybody realized she was in the Illuminati. And <laughs> oh, that's, a, that's a whole other part. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what she's doing. But, but uh, it, it's just that he's this hilarious like travel writer, but he wrote a book called A Brief History of, uh, or Short History of Nearly Everything. And it was one of these books that, uh, which is with Bryson, he's hilarious. So I would have to I'd read it on a plane. I'm like, I have to shut this because I'm laughing so hard that I'm literally uh, embarrassing myself, everybody around me. But in, he literally goes from the beginning to, you know, till, till today. He's a secular uh, humanist, spent, you know, his formative years in, in the UK. Uh, but he, he just has this really fun way of connecting complex ideas uh, to, to make them understandable, but also kind of hilarious in, uh, I can't remember which chapter this is, chapter four. He actually talks about um, that the Big Bang theory isn't about the Big Bang itself, but what happened after the Big Bang. Not long after, mind you, by doing a lot of math and watching carefully what goes on in particle accelerators, scientists believe they can look back to 10 to the 43rd po uh, power. Yeah. Seconds after the moment of creation when the universe was so small that it would have needed a microscope to find it. He actually goes into like a proton and then it's one, one or whatever of a proton would have been the size of what the universe would have been. He says, we mustn't swoon over every extraordinary number that comes before us, but it is perhaps worth latching onto one from time to time just to be reminded of their ungraspable and amazing breadth. Thus, 10 to the 43rd power is, and then he has like point zero with a 43 zeros wow. and a one at the end yeah. or one million trillion trillion trillionths of a second uh that in that like that in that moment like every like gravity was created that quickly and gravity which is extremely important and this is by the way 79 uh was i thought it was in the 50s but somewhere around 79 is where it what was called the inflationary theory of the universe which, you know, previous to that, we should have Hugh Ross. Some of you are acting like I'm an astrophysicist. But before that, we thought it was stationary, meaning that it was just this thing, this it block. Existed. Yeah. But by 79, an MIT student named Alan Guth uh, comes through. Anyway, he proposes this theory that is now widely accepted, that it is not, it, that is, it is inflationary. Uh, expanding. Expanding. And the eventual result, Bryson says, was the inflation theory, which holds that a fraction of a moment after the dawn of creation, the universe underwent a sudden dramatic expansion. It inflated. In effect, it ran away with itself, doubling in size every 10 to the 34th second. The whole episode may have lasted no more than 10 to the 30th seconds. 
That's one million, 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 millionth of a second. But it changed the universe from something you could hold in your hand to something at least 10 kabillion times bigger. Inflation theory explains the ripples and eddies that make our universe possible. Without it, there would be no clumps of matter and thus no stars, just drifting gas and everlasting darkness. Interesting language, isn't it? Um he talks about the, uh, the strong and the weak nuclear forces, the stuff of physics. Uh, these were joined an instant later by swarms of elementary particles, the stuff of stuff. From nothing at all, suddenly there were swarms of photons, protons, electrons, neutrons, and much else between 10 to 79th, 10 to 89th of each. This is according to the Big Bang Theory, which, of course, in the beginning, God created the heavens. And they're like, literally... Uh, he goes on to say that, uh, actually this is, I think this is Guth. Here's their, here's their explanation of this and how this could have happened. Uh, Alexander uh, Guth says, I, I offer the modest proposal that our universe is simply one of those things which happen from time to time. To which, as Guth, also the creation of a universe might be very unlikely Tiran emphasized that no one had counted the failed attempts, meaning that maybe there were failed attempts at this. But the point is, they have literally no explanation for this. Wild. Uh, but you know what? He'll, I'm just going to read this too. Th that there's six numbers in particular that govern our universe. And if any of these values were changed even slightly, things would not be as they are. For example, for the universe to exist as it does requires that hydrogen be converted to helium in a precise but comparatively stately manner, specifically in a way that converts seven one thousandths of its math mass to energy. Lower that value very slightly from 0. 0.0007 to 0. 0.006 percent, say, and no transformation could take place. The universe would consist of hydrogen and nothing else. Raise it slightly, say, to 0. 0.008 percent, and bonding would be so wildly prolific that hydrogen would long since have become exhausted. In either case, without the slightest tweaking, with the slightest tweaking of the numbers, the universe as we know and need it would not be here. Incredible. And there's an entire chapter, and that's just one of the number of the six things that are constant in our universe with it. So when they talk about fine tuning, we're talking like, God, you're not old enough to remember this. We used to have to dial in a radio station. I remember. Do you? Yeah. Like with a dial, not the button. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we had, we had, we had, uh, it was like your grandpa's car. <laughs> yeah. Grandma's car had a little dial. Yeah. I remember we had a little place where I grew up. We called it FM Hill. Okay. And FM Hill was, uh, this hill south of town, uh, that you could, uh, get up on the top of this hill. And, and if you dialed your radio just right, you could catch a radio station out of Kearney, uh, Nebraska, Nebraska sorry. Yeah. That had, uh, they played the rock and roll. Wasn't that a scene in Stranger Things? Yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah, we might have poked a hole in the universe. I don't know. <laughs> we were too busy getting hammered and making out. I don't remember. I just remember if you got your, you had to literally dial it. And if you hit it just right, you could get that radio station. Yeah. Just a fraction of the left, fraction of the right. It's static. It's this, and, but that was, and that's just for that radio station. And you're talking, what if there's like six of those radio stations and they all have to be dialed perfectly? So, yeah. If, who's doing the dialing to get it there? Exactly. Is the, question. the precision, the accuracy, the intention of all of it. I've had it described to me before um, as, you know, imagine like a, a junkyard, but like a plain junkyard. I think it's called a boneyard for, for a plane. Imagine a, a boneyard of, you know, every plain part imaginable in a junkyard. Right. You know, just mountains of parts. And for no reason whatsoever explodes and a, a fully functioning flyable Boeing 747 appears and is it is is able to be flown like that's what we're talking about here like out of nothing yeah now that has to be created by someone yeah now the analogy kind of breaks down because 747 uh, planes uh, Boeings are falling out of the sky <laughs> all, all their parts are literally falling <laughs> right. off the planes it's in the news every single right. day but so. you know but it doesn't because you you know if something falls off you're not blaming the plane you're blaming the person that built the yeah. plane they didn't screw put the screws in tight enough yeah. like it wasn't dialed in perfectly so actually it very much uh because I, I think it was John Lennox, I don't know, Patrick Behe, Stephen Meyer, I don't know, one of these guys, actually it might have been all three of them in a conversation, 
they, they one of the, I know it was Lennox uh, saying that he would talk to like computer engineers or whatever and say, look, uh, if you were working on your computer and you were told that it just spontaneously came into being, that there was nobody that designed it, would you trust it? Yeah. If you know, of course, the answer when you press into it is n no. Like it, it, they just don't spontaneously come into it being, and I'm not going to trust something that did. Yeah, nothing else in life is like that. Yeah, yeah. That the, the the beauty of of the creation imagery, if if you can dismiss, a, you know, the idea you know, or whatever, walk away from the idea or the, the, the debate, how long, when, you know, you, and just look at the actual like what it is created, whether it was six days or six billion years. The, God is not smaller but bigger with that because nobody else has a logical explanation. And when they go down those roads, whether it was Stephen B. Hawking or Richard Dawkins, eventually they come to language that is dangerously close to religious language. They just don't call it that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it certainly bolstered my faith. Like my faith journey over the decades was coming to the conclusion, okay, is there a God at all? And I, I didn't by remotely go down the roads as far as like someone like Hugh Ross explained, but but I did look at Buddhism and Hinduism and Islam and because it, I started with uh, St Stephen B. Hawking, like uh, is is the universe created? And he, in a brief history of time, uses language that even though he claimed to be an atheist is 100% religious language. So I'm like, okay, now we need to figure out if it was created, who created it? What is the most likely explanation of it? And in a little bit, it was kind of a scary journey because, goodness, if it, if it was Allah, oh, man, that's a – just because they're desi a designer doesn't mean he's good. Do you know what I mean? Like the, we needed to figure out who it was. And, mm -hmm. you know, over the years, the journey for you know, late 80s to early 90s, I just kept coming back to the conclusion – that Jesus is the most obvious answer because the most truth comes from that. The, the, the most uh, accurate explanation of the world around us, of humanity around us, everything is all in that explanation. Because um, I did, I kind of went down that. Like, I just want to know what the truth is. And whatever that is, let, I'll, let the chips fall where they may. If there is no God, I want to know that. If it's not Jehovah, Yahweh, you know, if it's not Jesus, I want to know that. And... It was a long journey that I didn't share. Thank goodness there wasn't Twitter back then for me. But I came back to those conclusions. And again, Bill Bryson, like I just keep coming back to these, you know, authors that it's it's, it's encouraging for me because I'll hear him try to explain it away. Like, you know, Christopher Hitchens tried to explain it away or this guy, like, what well, just these things happen from time to time. That's not an explanation. So that's that quote from Terrence McKenna that I quoted that, I, I just need one miracle, and then I can explain the rest. Yeah. Unfortunately, that one miracle for them is, like, way bigger than parting Red Seas, way bigger than blind men seeing. Like, those are all miracles, but this is a miracle miracle that is not explicable by any sort of natural cause. So for you on your faith journey, I mean, you I know you, dis, you dismiss it a lot, but you're a smart guy. You are. Um, I'm just a curious guy. You are. You're curious, and but you, you, you just you're a brilliant man, and you just take that for what it is. We all know it. We're just saying it out loud right now. But for you, on would you journey, want to be good looking or oh, impossibly good looking <laughs> or smart? Because I think it'd be. If we had to pick one or the other. Would you pick? Imp uh, I'd pick impossibly good looking. <laughs> Can't the both be true? Can you think of one? <laughs> I mean, can you think of the smartest guys that you could know? I mean, Hugh Ross, okay, brilliant. I, you know, he's not going on a, a swimsuit calendar. <laughs> you know what I mean? Maybe, I don't, maybe in his younger years, I don't know. Uh, Canadian. I, don't know. I, th I think, I think we can hold our own here in this room right now. I'm just going to speak some life into that. All right. <laughs> impossibly good looking. I would choose impossibly good looking. Okay. It would have been a lot easier to win Shannon over if I was impossibly good looking. I had to work pretty hard for that. Well, what I was going to say was, is you're. <laughs> Pushing through your faith journey, for you, the more data points, the more the more logic that came together, proved through through science, through um, 
I don't know, statistics, through investigation, through uh, all of these different areas. Like for you, you, the more data points that, that you got that confirmed, that backed up scripture, whether historically or scientifically, that is what pushed you over the edge to mm-hmm. confirm your faith. Yeah, the, the, there was something that no one could explain from a scientific perspective, even though they believed what they were saying. They could not, that causation of a beginning, they couldn't explain it. Other, eventually, you know, I can't remember which philosopher said, but at the bottom, the deeper you dig at the bottom of the glass, you're going to find God. And I kept digging and I kept coming to God. And which then made it kind of fun because I, I wonder if I'd have grown up in a different era, for instance, would I have looked at Darwin in the 1900s and, and been swayed by that? I hope not. Like if you were, if, if, if you're, if you were born a hundred years earlier. Yeah. Or 200 yeah, years yeah, earlier. Yeah. Like a buck 50, right? Because th- there was confidence in what he was saying and that it contradicted scripture. And it's one of the reasons why I respect what, like Dr. Easley talks about approaching the Bible from a purely scientific standpoint. I don't know that Doc said this, but, but what science are we talking about? Because science changes like we learn and it changes right. and yeah, it adapts right right and so and the more we learn uh where we are even today actually has confirmed creation it's it's, it's dis uh disconfirmed i don't think that's a yeah good lord we're going to be conjugating <laughs> verbs now like it, <laughs> it, it it does not darwinism is not confirmed through and I've, it's funny you read some of the comments on our Instagram and like oh you guys are saying Darwin well now we know I'm like no we don't like we they're all going to the same thing and no one can still explain why it is that when they decoded the human genome that it is a code in there that that was to be decoded nobody can explain that yeah and the Bible technically can because it, there is a creator and you get into like I, I remember one of the questions that I had. And I don't know if other people think this, but like if you could travel far enough into space to get to the edge of the universe and you poked your head out of the side of the universe, what would you see? You know, it's like you got to the window. What's outside the window of the universe? And yeah, I can't remember. You ever watch the Truman Show? Jim Carrey? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. G- great example. Yes. I wasn't thinking about that. Yes. And the answer was the real world. Yeah. But not in the universe because the universe is infinite and finite at the same time. Like the way that Einstein's theory of relativity and the way that time and space bends, there is no edge of the universe. If you went to the edge of the universe, you would end up right back where you started. And again, when they start using language to explain it, it's religious language without Mm -hmm. invoking God because infinite and finite, it's a paradox. And again, when you find paradox, you find God. And, you know, someday... It was one of the things I really appreciated about what, what Ross's description is, is that some of these laws that were put into motion for our universe to exist won't be needed anymore, which was that, that was very helpful for me when you think to the future of, you know, strong force, the weak force, dark matter, all that stuff that we need, gravity, that we won't need that anymore, uh, entropy, those things. Because because what scientists do say as well is that uh, we go on long enough and the universe will implode upon itself uh, again, that is a biblical language. They're using scientific language confirmed by the Bible um, with it. And it started in a garden. And I, what mattered to me, the, the reason I felt it was important as I prayed through, like going through Genesis 1, was if God went to all that trouble just so we could exist, then we probably should figure out why, right? Like he... He created a universe that is perfect for, in the way that you created a, a universe perfect for, what, what, what's the dog's name? Did we talk Buckeye. about Buckeye. Buckeye, of course it's Buckeye. Buckeye. Do we, is it Bucky for sure? Buck. Just Buck. Just uh, Buck. All right, Buck. Buck the good boy. Be careful how loud you're yelling at it. That's right. That's right. Yeah, but uh, you, you created a spot for Buckeye to come home, you know, a little bed, a little, I don't know if you guys are kennel people. He's got his yard. He's got a fence. Like he's got this perfect world for him. Because you want him to be happy and you want him to thrive. You want him to be a dog. And uh, and so the amount of trouble you are going to to create this, <laughs> yeah. right, 
uh, for this ungrateful little <laughs> creature that, <laughs> that doesn't thank you for it. We have the ability to not only thank God for it, but to thrive inside of it. And it felt very important for me personally, but also for us corporately to say, the fact that I'm breathing oxygen right now, the fact that I'm not floating away or being stuck to the earth, like, because this is so perfectly designed for us, but let's make the most of this. You know, this was, you know, we're in a fallen form because of what, well, spoiler alert, Genesis three, there's some things going to go down. Don't want to ruin it, but we are in that side of it, but it was the, the universe itself is still perfectly designed for us to thrive, to flourish. And we, I'm so grateful for that. I think it would be great for all of us to take that somewhere inside of us. Have you seen the Truman Show recently? Have you rewatched it lately? I stumbled onto it about three quarters of the way through. Maybe a plane. I don't. Yeah. yeah. Did you know it was, that was uh, filmed in Seaside? I was going to guess West Haven, but no. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. I mean, the Seaside, Florida? Seaside, Florida is where the, all the outdoor shots were oh, filmed. Oh, God, that makes so much sense. Yeah. So the and Seaside has looked like that for that long? Yeah, yeah. It, it was, uh, it's actually, well, here it is, fascinating. That's our favorite word. It's actually a really fascinating story. The, the architect for that particular uh, design, it was like a revolutionary design, um, kind of a half moon shape community vibe and is it's who they uh consult it's those the developers of west haven consulted of course <laughs> i didn't know are you serious the developers of oh seaside my florida gosh. which is why it is so similar huh and also why berry farms has a similar vibe as well and tollgate they they all are uh derivatives of the seaside design of which the truman show was filmed which is uh it's kind of a fun little fact huh yeah, there you go. I 100% did not know it, that. It's, it's a funny movie because it pokes in, it, it, it you know, it pokes fun of the idea of kind of what we're talking about that there's some other things behind the scenes here and what if you got to the edge, what's on the other end. Yeah. Um which when you think about it, I mean, so guys like Musk talk about the simulation right theory, which I <laughs> I don't know if he actually believes this, but he talks like he believes it. I think he does. He's mentioned it multiple yeah. times. Well, and it's catching steam. That we're in a simulation. Yeah. Explain that. The, well, the simulation, as best I understand it, correct me if, if you know more than I do, is that uh, none of us are, which by the way, this is Eastern mysticism dressed up with uh, with Silicon Valley. Yes. That this isn't real, that our world isn't real. It's somewhere, uh, it's... it's <laughs> It's like a Keanu Reeves movie uh, mixed in with Truman Show. The Matrix Truman Show vibe. Yeah. And, and again, follow that to its logical conclusion. So you're admitting that some entity somewhere is, true. is controlling and writing the code for what we're experiencing. A, you know, that's just a computer uh, code version of a religious story. Because like Eastern mysticism, by the way, says that this world isn't real, Hinduism, that we, uh, asp one day this, because this isn't real, we'll actually get to the real part of it all. Um, and that, again, that's a, another version of, of a simulation um, w when it relates to Christianity and even Genesis. And what I love about it is that it doesn't say that this world isn't real. So it's like... How do I say this right? The, on the the far left, we they worship the earth because the earth is all there is. We have to, at all costs, whatever we do, protect it. To the point now where if some of these guys in the World Economic Forum, Schwab, these guys, population control, which is just code for killing a lot of people because they're worshiping the earth. That's one hand because this is all there is. This is the only thing that's real. And if I'm going to, you know, if I can figure out how to live for a billion years, like Ray Kurzweil, whatever, then I'm going to need a whole bunch of people around here to not be able to be here so that I can survive because the world is all there is. And on the other side, you've got the Eastern, which is this world isn't real. So we, we don't care about it at all because we we're aspiring to this other spiritual realm. Christianity actually rejects both of those. It's like the earth is important, but not we're not going to worship it, like subdue the earth. Genesis one, do I go farm it, 
take care of it. Like that's that's not a left wing or a white right thing. White thing, right thing. That is a God thing because the earth is important. And on the other hand, um, we we don't worship it because uh, God created it. It is a creation, not a creator. So Christianity threads the needle so perfectly with the reality of the world, right? This is real world. There is a supernatural realm. Um, I'm almost I'm hesitating to use the word supernatural. I don't know what you think about this. Because it's basically a spiritual realm. Whether it's supernatural, I mean, it's just language, I guess. But to me, it's there's the spiritual realm and there's this physical realm that we're in. So it's not necessarily one is natural and one is supernatural. It's one is spiritual, yeah. one is physical. Yeah. But they're both realms and they're both real, which is what we're going to get to in the coming weeks when we get to Genesis 6 and Genesis 11, this you know, this cosmic rebellion that's happening behind the scenes that the scriptures are littered with while there's a physical rebellion happening that we that we get to see. There's what we see, what we don't see, but they're both every bit as real with uh, as far as reality goes. Yeah, I think I think this study through Genesis builds upon itself, right? So we're kind of in the this first chapter setting the foundation of 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 what's to come and we don't want to get ahead of ourselves here because there's 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 so much to discover that's layered upon yeah that keeps building upon that gets a little more complex and a little more yeah. complex to where we are obviously today and it informs us for today though because in the same way that Every time there's a, a a physical rebellion, so to speak, that's worldwide, there's there's spiritual things happening behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. That is still happening today. Yes. And when you start cross-referencing some of the places, um, Revelation was uh, where Satan, where you have your throne. It's um, I can't remember the city now, Sardis. Um, but it's in modern day Turkey. Like, right. and, and you begin to see some of those places. Like these are still the same places that are racked with war. Mm -hmm and famine and death and unsolvable problems in the physical. And I believe that there's, because there is a spiritual battle as well. There are spiritual beings, you know, Psalm 82, Deuteronomy 32. The Bible is full of language of these spiritual beings. And we do it a disservice to just divide it between angels and demons. Um, yeah, yes. Yes, we do. There, there. I feel like there's... There's all kinds of categories here, and that's that's something that we I wanted to kind of dive in a little deeper with Hugh about, but he wasn't really going there. He he was just saying categorically to yeah uh, angels or demons. But I think that's such a good example though of uh, if you approach scripture from just one discipline, you could instead of synthesizing multiple disciplines, right? So synthesizing theology, you know, astrology. Astronomy, sorry, not astrology. Astronomy. Well, there's astronomy. This, I mean, there's astrologists in the Bible. They're, they're, none of them are looked upon with kindness, I might add, but that's sure. in there, the stories in the stars. Biology. Um, but you, you synthesize them all together, and it makes way more sense. I just think he spent so much time on the, from the physical side of things, the scientific side, that either he hasn't gotten to or just— it's, it's a lot to learn, right? I mean, we think about it. Like, there's a lot of knowledge to have to gain if you try to have, be an expert in all of those disciplines. And so when it comes to the spirit realm, we've talked about Michael Heiser uh, multiple times mm -hmm. here. But, you know, he's not a fringe theologian, but he approaches it all. So if you listen to him, he'll actually dismiss a lot of things maybe that Hugh would say. Not reject them, but sort of speak of them dismissively. But he's never spent, he never spent any time on that. He, mm -hmm. His time was spent from the theological side and maybe part of our job is to synthesize. Yeah, no, I think you it know, is. Cause it's not that Mike Heiser is right. You know, Michael Easley is wrong and Hugh Ross is whatever. Like there, are, it's like all these different pieces of the same pizza that when they come together, make the whole pizza with it. Man, I'm hungry for pizza now. Yeah. I mean, you know, a couple of guys that have not, that are abstaining from carbs talking about pizzas. Yeah. That's a terrible difficult. thing. You know, there are 402 factors in total that keep us alive on the earth that, that have to be perfect. Perfect. You know, what's amazing about that is you hear, and you'll hear him talk about it, uh, though this planet uh, has water. So there's, there's probably life on this planet. Uh, water is one of those 400 factors. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Just because there's ice on Mars means nothing yeah. to us. I, and I think it's those, because their atmosphere is even like the, um, well, I guess you kind of covered that, like without the right amounts of uh, mm -hmm. 
uh, atmosphere, like the, there's just a darkness that covers the, the planet. Like if you're standing on Venus, you would not be able to see the stars because it's covered with darkness. Yeah, it has to have the right range of, um, the, the correct mix of gases and oxygen it has to be yeah. correct. And if I'm remembering right, oh man, I wish I remembered. It used to, that number has only increased because it's, what do you say? It's not 400? 402. 402. The first time I ever read anything about that in the 90s, I think it was 20. Oh my. Which parenthetically is a lot. Yes. And it just keeps increasing. And then it got to 200 and 250 and now 402. All of them have to be present. One of which is uh, that the moon holds the earth at a 23 and a half degree tilt. Yeah. For for all of this to, to work, which does two things. Um you know, addresses the uh, the old flat Earth uh, conversation, <laughs> which I think feels like it's died down a little bit. I don't know if it has. I don't know. I want it to. Um, Elon Musk's uh, pictures from SpaceX are kind <laughs> of. It looked pretty round this week. Even yeah, yeah. I was like that, that. Definitely looked like a sphere to me. <laughs> it's kind of hard to argue, although everybody thinks it's CGI at this point. Uh, it's no. like, come on, people. All right, um, but. Uh, you you I love how you address the uh, the moon landing joke or the moon landing <laughs> controversy on Sunday and I knew I knew exactly where you were going like before you got there I was like this is exactly what he's going to say and you you for sure said it um cuz you had to you had to address the crowd you know I mean it's probably I didn't know the room you know look you know so it, what it did is it caused me to go look it up to see how what's the percentage of Americans Oh no! That believe the moon landing was faked. Do you have any guesses? Twenty-eight percent. Man, is it? You are good. It's twenty percent. That's twenty. I'm ten percent off, so that's not that good. Twenty-one percent of Americans believe that the moon landing was faked. What's interesting about that, though, that was a 2021 number. Oh yeah. Well, and maybe has, I'm sure it's gone up since then, but that number is three times larger than it was in the late 90s. So it is picking up steam. Right. Which is a, it's just an interesting <laughs> little tidbit. Well, well it's thing, funny you address that. Well, the, it is really funny. You know, it definitely got the laugh. I mean, it was a cheap laugh, but, you know, sometimes yeah. I don't have enough money for a good laugh, so I just throw the cheap one. But the thing about the moon when it comes to our creation, I, if I'm remembering this correctly, uh, our moon in proportion to the size of our planet is the largest in our solar system. Um, and it is a hundred percent necessary for it to be not only the size that it is, but the distance away that it is to be able to sustain life on our planet. Like that thing, when we're looking up in the sky, that when the Bible talks about rules over the day and over the night, like it's, there's a word of rules that is a very fascinating idea that it genuinely rules, so to speak, the biology, the gravity, all that stuff. It, without it, we aren't here. So it's, it's so ruling. It is definitely like I don't it's not like, a you know, it doesn't have a gavel and, you know, and a robe, but it is ruling over the science of keeping us alive. And. We landed on the moon with a craft like two weeks ago, and nobody's talking about it. We, we, we That's a fascinating thought when you know, with that, right? Like, like we just we, dropped something on the moon. Yeah, we dropped a um, some sort of you know discovery vehicle on the moon, like literally like two or three weeks ago. Yeah. And nobody's really like it's not even that big right. of a deal. The reason that I'm intrigued by interplanetary, the moon, whatever, is that guys like Musk. Again, back to the Silicon Valley religion. For us to survive, they believe we're going to have to be an interplanetary species to survive. Like they have, they have rejected God, and so this our if we're going to save, be saved, we have to save ourselves. And it's almost like they don't know or ignore or just figure we'll figure it out. But like the four hundred and two things required to support human life. I don't know how many of them exist on Mars, but it's not 402. There's a reason why they got to get, you know, wear a suit, you know, when they get out of that thing. Like, it, it, it does not support life. Another movie reference to follow up with is go watch Interstellar. It, oh. it attacks some of this stuff. Can I highly recommend, though, 
not watching that on a long <laughs> flight where you're fading in and out of sleep. You can't tell what's uh, reality and what's oh, a dream <laughs> dude, or, or the it, movie. <laughs> it was the some of the most fun I've ever had uh, unaided by chemicals as a younger man. Uh, yeah, I'm just waking up like, wait, is that a dream? Am I like, <laughs> I can't remember. I was flying. It might have been Asia. It was one of these long flights. I'm completely exhausted and I'm just nodding in and out of sleep watching Interstellar. Fantastic movie. It was, yeah, I did finally watch it on an actual screen and yeah. So good. Definitely rocks it. Do you know where you're going to be on Monday, April 8th of this year? Because there is a complete full solar eclipse happening. Are you watching this stuff online, man? So, okay, so here's where I'm conflicted. So for those that may not be aware, there is a solar eclipse traversing across America um, from from like the southern tip of Texas all the way up into New York. And it's going to cross most of the Midwest, um, like full eclipse, like 100% eclipse, um, through like Kentucky, parts of um, Western Kentucky, um, into Indiana and Ohio, all the way up in New York, et cetera. And you're going to be able to see it very, very well here in Tennessee. I think it's a 90% eclipse from here in Tennessee. And there are so, I mean, yeah, the social media and the conspiracies are through the roof that the world's going to end on Monday the 8th because of this solar eclipse. I'm conflicted because... I'm going to the beach that weekend, and I'm driving back that day. On the 8th? Uh-huh. And, you know, every time I flip on the the uh, the Twitter machine, it's, you know, reminding me that it might not be a good idea. And the suggestion is right now that it's going to affect everything. And help me, in case I'm missing this, because I clearly am. How is this eclipse different? It's not. Then, so, so why would we not travel on April 8th? I remember when I we had know. the eclipse a few years ago, we, we all went over to Jamie Brandenburg's house and you know yeah. cooked hot dogs and, and, I don't know. and looked at the eclipse. We weren't supposed to look know. at it, but we did. So what's the difference on this one? Why? What are they suggesting is going to happen? Well, supposedly, okay, so the, 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 the eclipse that happened a few years ago went from the northwest down to the southeast. Okay. okay. So just imagine drawing a line from the northwest down to the southeast in your mind. And now this eclipse is going to travel from the southwest to the northeast. Okay. okay. So kind of the opposite direction. So apparently it draws this X over the country. And, w- you know, wherever this X exists is apparently, you know, troubles brewing of some sort, and nobody can explain why. Is it going to be an earthquake? Is it going to be, is there something, you know, that's going to happen that's that causes, you know, the electrical grid to shut down? Is there going to be, is the government going to use this event to spark something or take away something or do something, you know? So the so it's not like a, they're talking about like a solar flare taking out electrical stuff. It's just more like... Because it coincidentally makes an X. And that it's going to be the, like the longest duration of lights out, essentially. It's like four, uh, I think it's four minutes and 19 seconds or something like that. Like it's a, statistically speaking, it's a very long time. Like the longest complete eclipse for like the next 100 years. And so, you know, people are making things of it right. that probably they shouldn't. All I know is I'm going to be on the road driving could be a good day then because it'll be all clear if, if enough people are listening to this. Maybe. I mean, maybe. Dude, If let me tell you what. If it all goes down, isn't Bucky's where you want to be anyway? Like, isn't that <laughs> the, the the lifetime supply of salted and cured meats that they've got stored in those places? I'm going to have to lock in my Bucky's locations on my drive home because I might be pulling over. Get to a Bucky's. Yeah. I So I've – so far – and I look, I'll do respect to anyone because I'm willing to learn – but so far, all I've seen, I've seen no, nothing scientific at all that would explain why electrical grids would go down. And instead, what I've seen is a lot of people extrapolating uh, things in Scripture that are actually not there. They, the old saying, you can torture the Bible. You know, it's like a man. You torture him long enough, you can make it say whatever you want it to say. And, I, you know, I, I was reading one one post from a, a mutual friend, and it was like— 
none of this makes any sense. Like it was like trying to explain something by connecting 14 things that are un, right. c- unconnected and somehow this is now connecting with it. And so I, w- I was unconvinced by it um, other than you know, Jesus is coming back. And if he comes back April 8th, that means we don't, you know, it's before tax day. So there's a, <laughs> the, so the, I'd be cool with that, you know, if it shuts down the IRS. But um, yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know. Well, speaking of solar eclipses and red moons and... <laughs> You're gonna to transition to the red heifer, aren't the you? Red heifer, <laughs> all the rage. Well played, everyone from CBS News. Like mainstream news is now covering this. Over the past two weeks, it's been this f- flood of red heifer news yeah. uh, across mainstream media to Glenn Beck to Alex Jones and everybody in between is talking about the red heifers. And I'm curious on your your thought on this, your your take on this, because. Not only is it getting like massive coverage right now, um, people are believing that it's going to happen. Like it could be tied to, and the the timing of these these eclipses that are happening. Um, oh, they're connecting it to the red heifer. There's yeah, like huh. like all of these things are happening right now. Like so, there's yeah, there's okay, an eclipse, okay, there's, okay. There's, there's there's this war and that war and the timing of scripture and and because these heifers are coming from Texas. <laughs> It's just, it's all convoluted. But the fact of the matter is the mainstream media is talking about these red heifers. And those that may not know um, may, may be interested to, to understand what these what this is about. Um, these red heifers, they're significant in, um, in you know, not only Jewish uh, law, but sp- specifically to a prophecy. In, and I believe it's the book of Numbers. So— Okay, so my understanding of it is this: there is it's not there isn't a prophecy in Numbers. Numbers nineteen is just instructions from God on a sacrifice, uh, specifically Numbers nineteen, verse two. This is the requirement of the law that the Lord has commended. Tell the Israelites to bring you a red heifer without defect or blemish, and that has never been under a yoke. Uh, there's, I think it goes on to actually explain like the, 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 the um, directions and the, but the, the point being that a red heifer is just part of a sacrifice, uh, purification, if I remember right, I, we need Dr. Easley here for this point being that it was a, an active a red heifer was an active part of the sacrificial system in the temple, in the Jewish tradition, in the same way, the Passover lamb, you know, there's just different sacrifices. And so the theory is um, that for the temple to be rebuilt. Yes, yes, that's correct. Yeah, thanks for correcting me on that. Yeah. It's, it's the, the heifers are essential for the preparations of the construction of the third temple. Right, right. Like they, they are needing the ashes. The ashes are needed for a purification process for the building of the third temple. I guess they're kind of reverse engineering this in saying that um, that the the current Temple Mount, yeah, is is because it's under attack, quote unquote. Yeah, that they are closer to the building of the third. Yeah, and because of that, these heifers need to be ready in waiting, of which they are. Yeah, and leave it leave it to Texas to be the ones to bring red heifers over. The reason I'm fascinated by the the recent uptick of conversation is this is not new. It's a couple years old at least. Yeah, in, I think in terms of the the, the Texas. Yeah, if, if I remember cows. right, 3 or 4 years ago was when the Texans brought the red heifers over. And it was a big deal for orthodox yes, Jews because there, you know, there is an ongoing plan to rebuild the temple. And um, this is not conspiracy theory stuff. There's they, they, whoever is behind that movement, they actually have, you know, all of the utensils and the, the things needed, you know, the, the golden lathe, you know, all that stuff. They just need a temple. And so the prophecy watchers extrapolate that um, – because we we know is that there will be a temple. The Bible speaks of a temple, and right now there is no temple, and so that's part of the 
idea that we could build a temple and speed up the return of of Messiah. Correct. Uh, the problem with that logic is that uh, the, the, Jesus told us there's really only one way to hasten his return, and that is that the, this gospel will be preached in every nation, tribe, tongue, and then the end shall come. So uh, focusing on building a temple is cute, but that's not what Jesus told us to do. Now, on the other hand, the folks in Israel and uh, Hamas especially, they're taking this deadly seriously. Yes. Um, when they called their attack the Al-Aqsa flood, speaking of the Al-Aqsa mosque, which is on the site of where the temple is located, or was located, now it's a mosque. Uh, when they heard and saw photos of red heifers, they knew exactly what was going on. They knew exactly what it meant. And that's exactly why they were talking about it in their press releases. I mean, they're doing press conferences talking about red heifers in October. Okay. Yeah. So for whatever reason, now CBS, now I would guess this would be 100%. I'm just guessing. But I think that I could back this up just based upon experience. The reason why now CBS, all these media are taking up on it is because it creates an anti-Zionism and it's an anti-conservative thing. Yeah, that's so, uh, I would totally agree with that. Right? Cuz that uh because these are, you know, these are Texans and all the media hates Texas. Um they, they all love uh seemingly from New York Times to whatever, they they're very much pro Hamas. So to be able to it's like a the perfect uh stew of anti-conservative and Christian ideology in one report would maybe be why they're now talking about it. I don't yeah, know. it paints it paints Christians um, and the Jews as aggressors. Yeah, right, because they're trying to usher this in. Yeah, for something. Yeah, and to be clear, there are some hardcore Orthodox Jewish believers uh, believing in Yahweh, not Jesus believers. I might add, who want to sacrifice a red heifer at the Temple Mount. And I don't think that's happened yet, but that is their goal. Now it's being prohibited. Yeah. I mean, what wrong? The, the images, just, yeah. The images that are floating around the video this, this past week is the, uh, the altar that's been built. Have you seen this? Uh, not recently. There's this, this specific altar that has been built and is ready to go. Is it like on wheels? Like on a road, yeah. like a road case? Yeah. Pretty much. It looks like it's, it's, it's this, it's large, but it looks it's a mo, it's like a mobile altar unit that yeah. they can put into place. Now, I had also read that there were they were down to five heifers of of late because um, some of the others got dismissed because they're impure. Now it's down to two, three more were dismissed apparently over the past several months. They found impurities on these heifers, so now they're down to two. Mm. Which also begs the question for me, like, okay, so you know. Are, are, if they are genetically modifying and engineering these pure red heifers, like, and it's just completely unnatural, like, how is that even? I don't think it counts. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't. I do. and I don't. How does that count? Yeah, and I don't think that. I, I mean, look, I could be wrong, but I don't even think that the rebuilding of the temple, like specifically, when you speak of like the theology of the rapture of the church. Like that is a signless event. In other words, there's nothing left to have to happen for that to happen. If, if you are someone who holds to the view of a pre-tribulation rapture of the church away where God's judgment, you know, is poured out on the earth, um, that the uh, temple does not have to be built in order for that to happen. You, it's, it's a fun conversation. Could it be? Absolutely. Um, the, the, as it stands right now, if you're looking for World War III, the first person to start building anything resembling a Jewish temple on that mountain uh, fired the first shot of World War III, which may have already started anyway. Because the, the biblical, and we go back to the spirit realm, or the unseen realm, the demonic forces that hold that mountain hostage right now uh, when Jesus comes, splits the Mount of Olives in half, takes over again, you know, whatever. Like, there will be uh, a temple, right? The the earth, the Jesus, it's, we will no longer need one because we're going to be the temple. Um, some point, 
in the future, the biblical prophecy does allude to and speak specifically of a time of sacrifice uh, in a temple. And the Jewish people, especially the Orthodox, they have a problem, and that is that their Torah tells them that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. There is no sacrifices happening, and there's no temple happening, and so they're having to sort of extrapolate and do workarounds on how they could be forgiven because they they don't believe in a Messiah who was the last sacrifice that, that ends all sacrifice, the, yeah. the Passover lamb. They don't believe that happened already. So they need a temple. They're build, that's why they're so aggressive, especially the Orthodox, because they know that they've got a problem, and that is that their sins, there's no way that they could be guaranteed their sins are forgiven without sacrifice. Tis the season. I mean, we are in, uh, we're heading into Palm Sunday already, in Easter Sunday. Yeah. Uh, and so as, we're, as we head into chapter two of Genesis, what's on deck? Oh, buddy. That's a good question. I mean, we're headed into the, we're in the garden. Yeah. You know, the, the first marriage uh, happens, the, the teamwork of Adam and Eve together. Uh, in, in the imagery around that is like, in fact, this, here's, here's what I think I'm going to open with. Just float this by. Uh, you saw the story that was all over the internet of a, a guy that left his wife behind at the airport because she wanted to get Starbucks and so she missed the plane. <laughs> no, I didn't. You didn't see this? I missed that one. Oh my gosh. Oh it was, it was great. Like, because the question of what I want to do is kind of an informal poll is how many husbands would have left their wife. And this was a transcontinental flight. It wasn't like they were flying to, oh to Jersey, but he warned her, don't, you don't have time. She went anyway and she missed the plane and he went home without her. And the internet is exploded with controversy over who oh, would you great. would you leave your wife or would you not? So I think I'm going to open with that question. I don't know if we could do like a live poll, like where people because no one's going to raise their hand and admit that <laughs> the private poll. But uh, but uh, that you know, the point here's Eve and Adam. They're having like the the first marriage fight right in history because Adam was not off like I've joked about. He wasn't off like picking flowers and naming bugs. It says he was right there, right in the sure. fall. But uh, anyway, I, I might open with that, but I, I want to dive into you just... stepping on the plane? Are, are you... Oh, she's gone. Yeah, I mean, look, if that's her fault, you know what I'm saying? This is a you have to take responsibility for your own actions. I'm the professional traveler. You take a coffee at Starbucks, and I told you, and you did it anyway. Yeah. I'm not paying for your sins on that one. That's, yeah. that's on you. Now, by the way, I will say that, that doesn't happen to us because my wife has, and she never listens to this, so I can repeatedly refused because she doesn't have time to get her TSA pre-check. Now, so she... You, you go through two separate lines she, then. Yeah. Now, she thinks that I should go with her ah. and not leave her alone. Ah. Okay. Now, I'm talking seven years in on TSA pre. She's had time. This may come up as Sunday as an illustration as well. And yeah. Maybe. Because yeah. Don Plotz gave me this advice, and it has worked like a charm, and that is, I will go to... I'll go through TSA pre, but this way I can get to Starbucks first and order for you. <laughs> so your coffee is way is brilliant. Like some of the best marriage advice I've ever gotten. That's great. So I will, uh, that's how I've done that. And she still has not gotten her TSA pre. So she has to go through the long line. Yeah. Yeah. With, uh, with the, with the peasants and, you know, with the, <laughs> we got to take your shoes off and, you know. Like, yeah. That's me. Yeah. It, it's not that hard to get the TSA pre, right? Anyway, point is, uh, you know, the, the 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 difference between man and woman. What, what I don't know if I'm going to touch into or not is he names Eve woman. She doesn't actually get a name of Eve until Genesis three after the fall. Wow. So he says you get to name every creature. He names. I will call her woman. And she doesn't get an, a name even until after. And what I think I'm going to dive into is it isn't because she was less valuable. It's not because she was an animal. It's because in the way that we were meant to be, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone, is that you don't know where one starts and the other stops. It, it doesn't make her less. It actually makes her more. Mm -hmm. And then when the, what the fall will do 
See, I, uh, I think part of the curse is you will desire his position. And, and what it's really saying, another way of saying it is that um, I don't have a, I don't have a place right now because my place was, we were, to, our play, my place was our place and now there's two separate places. Mm. And so now we have to have discussions about whether I'm going to be left at the airport or have to go through TSA pre because we're not the same person anymore. We're two separate entities. So I probably will dive in a little bit on the way that marriage was meant to be, why it is not that way now and ways in which we can um, aspire for those yeah. Eden moments in our marriage. It's good, man. I'm looking forward to it. Um, so it's okay that I can I can call my wife woman around the house, like, woman. Oh, they love it. Yeah, that was her. Occasionally, first. I'll do that at the church. Woman, where are you at? <laughs> yeah, she does not. <laughs> it was her original name. Yeah. Whoa, <laughs> man. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for this uh, this deeper podcast. We are we are trudging through Genesis and it's building. There's layers of complexity, and we're starting it, it, on the foundation of this uh, through chapter one. If you missed last week's teaching, of course, you can go back and listen to it. You can go back and watch on our YouTube channel. Thank you for those that have been watching on YouTube faithfully each week. Thank you for your comments, for your emails. And if you have any questions, again, uh, within the series, as we're going through this chapter by chapter, verse by verse, if you have questions that you feel like would make sense uh, for our discussion on a podcast, go, go ahead and send those to us. Info at conduitchurch.com, and we will see you next week.